Welcome back to the Unanimous Decision Podcast. I am your host, Deepalm. Follow me on Twitter at Deepalm66. Follow the show on Twitter at UDPod. Follow the entire MTR network at the MTR network. You found us. Don't lose us. Subscribe in the iTunes store. Subscribe anywhere. Podcasts are giving away for absolutely free. Also, you can subscribe on Spotify. It's the most used audio app, and that uh, we're happy to be on there. So if you have friends who listen, who want to listen to the podcast, we're always like, I don't know how to listen to podcasts. I guarantee they have Spotify. Search Unanimous Decision or MTR Network, and you'll be able to find us, and you can subscribe there as well. The five-star reviews, though, you can only leave those on iTunes. If you leave it in a five-star review, we'll read it on the air, um, no matter how mean or you know sad it is. No matter how much it hurts me internally, no matter how much uh, I have to stall to try to pull them up to see if there's any new ones, like I'm doing right now. But uh, no, we do appreciate it. everything you guys do uh, to support the podcast means a lot. And uh, we're going to get right into it because today it is kind of the weekend after Thanksgiving. A lot of sports have occurred. A lot of eating has occurred. And uh, I, the, our guest today, I've watched, I've watched this person ride a horse this weekend. I've watched this person shoot outlaws this weekend. I've watched this person orchestrate a wonderful Thanksgiving dinner this weekend. And only two of those things happened in a video game. It's my wife. It's Susan. How are you doing, Susan? Hi. Your intro really confused me. I was like, when did I ride a horse? Have I forgotten already? And then I remembered it's yeah, – it yeah, I got there. Yep. Yeah, no, yep. got there. I'm, glad, no, I'm glad to have you. Mm-hmm. Um, Susan's here partially because – it's Thanksgiving weekend, and if I'm going to bug someone, I'm going to bug someone who legally has to still love me, but also because there was a call out for it because we've been discussing a lot of pro wrestling on the podcast, and most people were grown at that, but I think a lot of people are actually into it because Becky Lynch is turning into the biggest thing in pro wrestling, and I wanted to bring you on to talk about it because you tolerate my pro wrestling love, and I love that, and I appreciate that, but the only time I've ever seen you really engage has been the last few months with this Becky, Charlotte, Ronda Rousey thing, particularly a couple of Sundays ago during Survivor Series, when you literally fell asleep during the main event, Daniel Bryan versus Brock Lesnar, excellent match, go watch it. But you were on the edge of your seat just the match before for Ronda Rousey versus Charlotte. What what about the way they're presenting it now kind of makes it appeal more to you? Just the, it was such an intense match. Um, right. And also just, I mean, being a woman, I, I, uh, I'm, I think it's more interesting. I, I found their, their storylines to be more interesting. I don't know if it's because they're newer and we haven't seen as much of them in the past, but right. uh, I've enjoyed the storylines. And also they beat the shit out of each other, <laughs> which is super fun. <laughs> it's wild. I because like violence. What can I say? It, it, you are married to me. Um, it's super fun because it's, like you see it all and you hear all the, it's all, it's all orchestrated forever, but then you saw that I showed you that YouTube video of Rhonda kind of cataloging what's happened to her over the last like eight or, or at that point it was like three days. It was like the welts from the kendo sticks and like the busted open lip and the busted open ear. It's just, you're right. It, it, they beat the hell out of each other. And I think that, and again, I didn't watch for a long stretch. So if I'm at, talking out of school, I apologize to you 2000 era truthers, but It feels like it's a more, they're treating it just not only like, oh, they're going to let them have athletic matches. We're going to let them have matches that make you a little bit uncomfortable because when Charlotte snapped and went to town on Ronda with that kendo stick, it was a little weird. Well, also, I mean, any, the couple of times that we have watched Ronda in a match, my thing is like, she could turn at any moment and just murder her (laughs) opponent because we've seen what she can do in a a ring just from her fighting MMA. But. Uh, it, it's a, it's like a little, makes me a little uncomfortable. But Charlotte is a beast, so it felt somehow more like a fair match. I don't know. They're they're so athletic. They're both giant, um, and it was a lot of fun. Because they're both the same, like roughly the same size. I think Charlotte's actually a little bigger. You're able to kind of suspend the disbelief that there's no way this woman could actually fight a Ronda Rousey because you're like, well, Charlotte's just big as shit. Well, also, I feel like Charlotte's like I can let loose. Mm, yeah, you know, she's not true. gonna. Uh, I feel like you're. You would assume that you can't really hurt Ronda Rousey. <laughs> really but she, it looked like she got her ass beat. <laughs> that's, and that's part of the art of it all, like to, to displaying that to even the back of the stage. I want to talk to you about someone who wasn't in the match, who's captured my heart and maybe the heart of all of America, and that's Becky Lynch. Oh yeah, she's super fun. Love a redhead, obviously. <laughs> obviously. But we've watched her turning from she like this since she's like turned quote unquote heel or I guess anti hero on Charlotte. 
She's been talking shit on Twitter, on Instagram. She's been um, involving Conor McGregor, being like, if he comes near me, I'll break his arm too. Like, this is something that you haven't really, I, I, as a wrestling fan, I've never really seen the hottest ticket in town be the women's, the women's uh, kind of showcase their matches because for so long, even going back to like the Carney days, it was kind of come watch wrestling and a women's match. And like now, it's like we're having a legitimate conversation where Becky, Ronda, and Charlotte, a three-way match between them, could actually headline WrestleMania. Yeah. Um, No, she's getting a lot of attention right now. Um, And I I love that, what, her catchphrase, the the man. Right. Like, she has to use something like that to get the attention. It's it's great. It's working, and um, it's fun. It's so fun because, I guess, like, Charlotte's dad was always, to be the man, you got to beat the man. And once she beat Charlotte, she started calling herself the man. And it's so funny because you can see, like, the veterans, like, Ron and Charlotte, or, excuse me, Charlotte and Becky are kind of doing the social media game one way, and then Ron is like, uh, I don't need to be called a man. Like it seems to be like some weird sexist ang- angle on it. And, Ron, and Becky was like, "I'm clearly talking over your head. I'm the man because <laughs> no one can touch me in this business." And it was, it was so funny because I know obviously they're telling a story. They're using social media to do it, but the idea that they would be, they would harp on the fact that she's just brand new. She's just green. She doesn't know what she's talking about. Sometimes to kind of tell that story was, it was, it's been a lot of fun. It's mean. I love it. It is mean. It is mean. It's very mean, girlsy. But uh, it's Mean Girls with Kendo Sticks and Steel Chairs. So totally. It works. All right, let's go from uh, quote-unquote fake fights to bigger air quotes, faker fights, because the real world wrapped up this season, this past Tuesday. And for those of you who don't watch, God bless you. You're probably a better person than both of us, but whatever. <laughs> um, we speak you up. Uh, we're yelling at your high horse right now. So they've done this like this. And this is not explaining it to you, Susan. I know you know. Um, <laughs> they've done kind of a trilogy of – the recent challenges. So it's been since the 30th anniversary of the challenge. And now we're in season 30, I guess too. And the, this last season was called vendettas too. And so basically you were paired up with someone you absolutely hate and you had to do all these challenges. And at the end, a million dollars on the line, there was no second place. There was no third place, but a million dollars for the team. They entered a wrinkle at the end here where it said the, the person with the best time in your team can select to split the million or keep the million for themselves. Well, this Tuesday, a team one, a team you and I find both, I believe you can say professionally and personally abhorrent. Absolutely. Okay. And that would be the team of Ashley and Hunter. They won a challenge, which is Ashley's second win, which there is no justice in the universe. Hope is a lie. <laughs> and because she had a better time over the final through Hunter, she was able to choose to take the million dollars or not. This bitch took the million. Um, Hunter reacted poorly. I'll First one to cop to that. And I will admit that my coloring the situation is I also don't like Ashley. I find her one of the most more odious personalities in the history of the challenge. And discounting the fact that, you know, producers produce what they produce and they condition us not to like certain people. Did you have a problem with Ashley taking the money? Um, you know my answer, and I know it's going to make you upset, but. Why are you on the podcast? I, <laughs> I, I don't. Um, mm. it, as much as I think that she, it, we all know who Ashley is as much as I guess we can assume that we know her based on our perception of her reality television right, right. persona. But, I know, uh, I know enough of her. I know what I've been shown. I tell you that much. I mean, she's, she's a dumb, dumb. She's, mm-hmm. she's not a great person. Nope. Um, I mean, she didn't make it into two episodes. I think of her season on the real world. So Before she got kicked off the show. This is a woman yeah, who was kicked off the real world for being too drunk and racist. Yeah, I just want to make sure everyone like, goes into this. Isn't that what the show is about? Fair enough. Uh, it's confusing. But uh, anyways, the way that she uh, clearly spoke about the things that he had done to her and said about her, and then they immediately played back the clip of him saying exactly what she said, I don't know. I can't get your money. Whatever. Get your money. I, I still think that what Johnny did when he took the money was way more shady. So, Aside, from, fa- aside from the fact that like, I think that you, you'd you have a bigger problem if you didn't hate Hunter as much. Oh, yeah. He sucks, too. He's an idiot. They're both, <laughs> neither of them are smart. Like, Ashley sounds like she's shit-faced all the time. Spoilers, cuz. Like, she's, she probably is. She's just, like, putting sentences together constantly. It's, it's insane. Like, I don't know how she's won, too. But, I mean, she's not who I would have wanted to win, obviously. But Well, it was an interesting final because running the final, there was no likable team. No. Like no. it was, it was an act. One of those situations where you're actively cheering against everyone. Like 
can the ground open up and swallow them whole? What if what if all teams die in the challenge? Who knows? Like yeah, I mean <sighs> maybe Car Maria and Murray, but you knew they weren't gonna win. Um, and you. honestly, I'm bummed at how their how their uh, season petered out because their <laughs> their friendship and how that built I think was one of the better storylines of the season. That's true. That's I'm true. talking and way too seriously about. No, 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 but it's fair because it is America's third major sport. Sorry, baseball and or hockey. And uh, I think that it's important that we wrap up the trilogy, give it the deference it deserves, because there's a reunion special coming up, and I wasn't going to watch. But then they showed me Dolph Ziggler was hosting, and now I'm curious. <laughs> so watch my Twitter feed this Tuesday. If I'm talking about the challenge, you have every right to mock me. I will not defend myself. Um, <laughs> the next thing I want to talk about was something that doesn't matter to you at all, but matters a lot to me, um, which is basically the subtitle of the podcast. Um, Kate Fagan, um, who's been at ESPN for five years, she is leaving ESPN. Um, her statement in the Washington Post was, to continue ESPN, I would have ha- had to have been immersed in day-to-day in sports, and I found myself more and more interested in other aspects of sports, like how it connects to our culture. That was not going to be the big business of ESPN. I think at one point I wanted to do a show, and we could do a show that made women's sports really cool. I thought there could be a show on some tangential topics, LB- LGBT issues and mental health. Five years ago, I thought I could host a show that introduces new female characters to the women's sports world. This isn't ESPN's fault, but I'm not that naive now. I still think that ESPN cares about those important stories regardless of whatever shift there is. This is coming on the tail end of the very high-profile departure of Jamal Hill and um, kind of through the lens of the knowledge that ESPN has been – their new public head has said that they wanted to get more to the day-to-day of sports. But in a situation where – I don't need SportsCenter to find out fantasy scores. I don't need um, NFL Today to read the latest highlights, to watch highlights. I have a cell phone and I have Twitter. Is it interesting to see ESPN kind of double down on the sports is just sports thing when we all kind of crack the code that even you, who was a, not immersed in sports culture growing up, but you can admit that you just look back and say, none of this is actually about sports. Yeah. I felt I was reading her statement earlier and it feels like she's trying not to burn bridges, you know, yeah. which I get, but it, it, I don't know. I don't like that. She gave so much credit to ESPN. Like it's her fault that she didn't realize that she couldn't do that there. Hmm. It's like, how dare she dream that she could, you know, like that's not her fault. That's great. It's great that she wanted to, and she realized she couldn't. And now she's stepping away. Um, and it's a shame that they aren't willing to do it. Uh, when uh, Mr. Pataro took over the top job at ESPN, his first remarks to employees included the statement that I do not believe we are a political organization and that um, while it wasn't necessarily dissimilar to what Skipper said, um, there's been more action, I think, in taking ESPN away from being the um, kind of even vaguely political as they were under Skipper. You've seen kind of Jamel Hill and Michael Schiff get thrown off of, of SportsCenter. You've seen the ESPN uh, strengthening their – uh, relationship with the NFL, they bought out uh, 538, which was uh, someone who helped predict the Obama run and kind of analytically, and they've been told to not do anything, I'm going to quote here, potentially controversial p- politically. I, and I just, I don't under, I'd like for them to define what political is because, uh, so as I think the listeners know, you've kind of brought me into the world of sports. Like, Sorry. Over and ab- yeah, uh, don't be sorry. It's great. The, I mean, the, the but the aspect of sports that I love the most is the storylines, the, mm-hmm. the stories about these different people who play in the sports, the coaches, all of that. And why is it political when you tell all the stories? You know, she just wants to hear. She wants to to make sure that everybody's stories are told, not just the ones that align with maybe a more conservative mentality. Right. It's sad. You're, yeah, you're 100 percent right. It's it's interesting that certain stories are even viewed as political. I don't see, and I think that it goes larger to what people say uses that out as I don't want to talk about politics. I'm like, I'm not talking about politics. I'm talking about representation and people's equality. Yeah. Like, that's not political. That's being a decent person and being a decent human being and being cognizant of the world around you. And spoilers, you can't do that in, in sports and not talk about the world because guess who plays the sports? The people who live in the world. Like yeah. I don't. It's one of those crazy things. Agreed. It makes little no sense to me. And uh, let's keep going because sports aren't about sports because the WNBA union is currently in a massive crosshairs. 
they've opted out of their CBA and they are asking the WNBA, the, the players are, for better treatment. And I know people are saying, oh, it's not profitable. Da, da, da. And I'll be the first to admit, I used to be one of those idiots. I used to. And it's so funny because I openly watch, I watch way more women's basketball in college than I do men's because I find the men's game unbearably bad to watch. And I love the women's college basketball game, but I never really gave the WNBA a chance. And I kind of wrote it off as this niche thing that the NBA did as charity. But what's interesting to me is that as the WNBA has been given more opportunities and like their, their games have been on ESPN and national television, and I've watched it more, it's crazy because now I respect and like it a lot more. So... The question now becomes, because the, the main issue here is that the WNBA players aren't treated as professionals. What do I mean is treated as professionals? They aren't paid with the um, commiserate work that they're asked to put in. They they aren't given health care. And uh, there's, a, there's a story by Monty Jones tells that he saw uh, well, someone he knew in an airport once and then saw all these women behind him and said, wait, is that – that's a women – this is a WNBA team flying coach, and they're playing the day they land. These are things that wouldn't happen in, men, in men's sports. These are things that don't happen in the NBA G League. And so there's a lot of articles out there right now about the collective bargaining and, and what's going on with the CBA and the WNBA. And I would just like people to remember that they aren't asking for NBA money. They're asking for it to be taken care of, to be treated like professionals. In 2003, when... David Stern basically crushed the WNBA in their last negotiations. He stated that the NBA was losing $12 million a year because of, because of the WNBA. This summer in negotiations, the NBA said the same damn thing. The curious part is the, the WNBA players have no access to the books that they're actually claiming losing the $12 million. And the fact that this number would not have moved over the course of 15 years seems a little strange. WNBA players make fractions of what they can make overseas playing. The same game. So you look at how the game's grown. You look at how when you've invested in the game, it's grown. And you look at, you know, kind of the sports landscape going forward as the NBA is growing and the WNBA commiserately is growing as well. Do you think that this is a situation where it's anything more complicated than just a devaluation of them because it's women playing basketball? Like I'm trying to find, like the ratings are up, partnerships are up, FanDuel a partner with them this year, Twitter partnered with them. The players are using their voices out. Like they're becoming, they're making themselves in the stars. They've said, this league won't do it for us. We're going to be heard. We're going to be able to talk. And while there are outlets who are stating how greedy these WNBA players now are, are, are acting or whatever, I think that the world may have turned a little bit on this and kind of, am I being overly hopeful to think that we would have the backs of the players in this for once in sports? Uh, I mean, it's hard. I think it's hard to, feel hopeful in situations like this that's just my it's it sounds really depressing but <laughs> i mean why would they give them more money when they don't have to i mean they they don't even give them the same percentage of of profits right, right. um so th i mean that's the fact that they could just argue that like it's it's awful it's so sad also i mean the fact that they're they're calling out that they're not investing, like they don't expect them to invest the same amount of money or marketing or anything like that into the WNBA like they do the NBA. But if you don't invest anything in it, of course it's not going to su succeed at a comparable level. That's just right. how business works. Like it's not <laughs> complicated. Like they're just reporting the weather, saying you know they're not. It's not successful. They're not making any money, but they're not speaking to the reasons why. And yeah. it's because they don't have to. It's why would they give them more money if they don't have to? People it's are greedy crazy. and terrible. <laughs> Look the <laughs> pessimist off. Um, no, I think you're 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 not you're not wrong. But I think that public opinion and public, I think that the environment in which they're negotiating is more amicable to players' rights than it has been in the past, particularly these players. The biggest problem for me is that Lisa Borders, former head of the WNBA Players Association, who helped grow this to where it is, she she's gone. Yep. Like she walked out and we could have a much longer conversation about Lisa Borders and her penchant for leaving situations. And now she's running me too, like the organization. We should all like, it's good for her, but maybe people should pay closer attention to what her past. Yep. Um, I'm trying not to say anything derogatory or directly inflammatory about Miss Borders. 
Um, but facts are facts. Like I can look at a timeline and see when she leaves places and where she goes next. I, no, I, I mean, hope. Go ahead. I hope. I'm just saying. I mean, yes, obviously. Uh, I, I hope that the public opinion will help push this situation in a, a better place than it landed um, over a decade ago. But I don't know. I don't know, man. <laughs> Look, and the, the thing hopeful. about it is this. This time we have the we have the we we can track it. Like once they started investing and promoting the league, you saw a return. There was a tangible ROI. Numbers are up. Attendance is up. Everything is up. So if I just think it's better business to say let's keep investing. It's a yeah. growing stock. Like why wouldn't we invest? Yeah. I, totally. I hope so. But it, it, and there's I mentioned in the article I'm going to share in the show notes that. You know, in recent years, we've seen the women's soccer team fight for uh, equitable pay and equitable um, split, the women's national hockey team. I think that this is a league, not a national team, but I think that that precedent could help frame the discussion as we go into it. Now, um, speaking from some, uh, going from something that's a, not a waste of money to something that most certainly was for everyone involved, Tiger Woods and Phil Mickelson played each other in golf on pay-per-view. And if you missed it, well, not so bad on you because the pay-per-view was going for $20.00. Um, it was carried um, via Bleacher Report Live, uh, Comcast, Charter, Spectrum, Cox Communications, Dish, AT&T, DirecTV, Uverse, Cablevision, Verizon. Everyone was making this available via uh, Bleacher Report Live, and it failed. It didn't like let certain people log in, so they had to end up giving it away for free. A lot of the cable systems have offered all these refunds. Susan... I want you to promise me something. If I ever tell you I'm going to spend twenty dollars to watch two rich people gamble a lot of money over golf, that's ground. You can leave me if you choose. Like that's the the win. Like okay, just so people didn't know and do the four people who care. Phil beat Tiger in twenty two holes for nine million dollars. No thanks. This is ridiculous. Rich people battling each other for more money. I'm good. <laughs> hey, I watch the news every day. Hi, right. okay. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm good. It, if you if so you started odd. watching golf, we would have problems. I, I watch <laughs> golf some. I watch nah, if Tiger's involved, I watch. Nah, if Tiger's that's involved, different. That's that different. Very different. It's very different. It's Especially in like the last year when he's had a major comeback. Outside of that, nah. Not interested. What's the point? Like, let's yeah. not let's not hurt ourselves. Old um, rich white people fighting each other for more money. Um, and gosh. Tiger Woods. <laughs> and Tiger Woods. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the golf pay per view golf not the future. Things we saw Monday night might be the future. The Chiefs and the Rams combined for about a thousand points on Monday night football, um, and people were touting it as kind of the future of the sport. You know me. I'm uh, not a big score a bunch of points guys doesn't necessarily make a good football game to me. It was interesting to watch these two offenses kind of throw haymakers at each other for four quarters, but it was a lot of fun to watch. Like Aaron Donald remind us why he's probably the best offensive player in football. Do you, so you, you come to football very late. I've dragged you to football again, really sorry. Cause she's a Georgia fan and a Falcons fan. And we'll talk about both of those later, but do you think just watching a bunch of points is fun or for someone who's new to the game, like kind of a casual viewer, like more than casual? Cause sorry. Um, is it more fun to you just watch a bunch of points or is it more like, uh, I guess, cause this game had both where it's like highly contested and a bunch of points, but I don't think that just scoring points is a sellable thing. And, and I, I agree, but this, this game felt different. Um, uh, it was so yeah. fast paced, mm-hmm. um, and just the back and forth of it until the very last second. Um, right. It was super entertaining. I mean, and that's what I'm here for. It was. I got some numbers for the game. Um, um, there were three. Okay, so the two the two teams combined for seven punts. There were three defensive touchdowns. They scored as many combined touchdowns, 14, than the Buffalo Bills had scored all season, 13, going into this weekend. Patrick Mahomes threw for 478 yards at six touchdowns, throwing 33 for 46, and lost. Ooh. This is the first time in the NFL history that two teams have scored 50 points, which also reminds you that this is the first time a team has scored 50 points in a game and lost in the NFL. It, it's fine. It's great. It's very exciting. They outscored the Bills in October. Like, I don't, I don't know. This is uh, – the, the, the Rams were a buzzsaw. I know this is – the thing about it is like, people are going to try to say this is the future of football, but – these are two high-level offenses playing in a very high-level way. 
if you turn on today's games, however, for instance, most teams aren't equipped to give you this. Like, this is a lot of talent on one field doing a lot of crazy things. Um, Seahawks, Panthers was a lot of fun, but not because they were just unstoppable offense. They're just really good play. The Panthers defense, I think, is kind of maybe hot garbage, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> but it, it, I think that saying this is the blueprint is going to get us a lot of things because now the question becomes, if you're a good team, if you're a good offense with a bad defense, you can be competitive. But if you're a bad – let's say you have a mediocre offense but a great defense – I guess it doesn't matter anymore. Yeah, just the fact that this this game was had so many like firsts associated with right, it, right. it doesn't really make me feel like this is the future. Okay. Like it just happened, you know? It was like I mean? an outlier. It was it was, yeah. it was it was it was something crazy that occurred in totally. an environment that's conducive to it. Because let's be real, the rules have changed. They changed the way they call the game. They changed the way the game is played to where things like this. So I think that this is indicative of like passing numbers like when you say like this guy's broken so many thousand yards over so many years like that's going to matter less Mm -hmm. because just the style of play is more conducive to of course you're going to throw a bunch of passes of course you're going to throw a bunch of touchdowns and i think that you have to go to like higher analytics like qb ratings and then quarter and then like uh, yards per attempt and things of that nature to see really tell you how good a team is um more numbers 105 points third highest total in nfl history second highest in super bowl era um, the Chiefs are the second team in NFL history and the first the Super Bowl era to lose two games in the season in which they scored 40 points in each of those games. The Chiefs have averaged more points in losses, 45 and a half, than in wins, 34.8. When you say it like that, it makes them sound like a bad football team. <laughs> and they can score all those points and still lose? What? <laughs> right? Like, that's what's crazy to me. The game's over under, which we gamble on sometimes. Not me, but people gamble. Um, <laughs> closed at 64, which is the highest since they've been doing it since 1986. And the game hit the over before the end of the third quarter. The offenses combined is the, for 1,001 yard. Mahomes' passer rating of 117.6 is the highest passer rating of any quarterback who threw three picks in a game. Man. Like, Mahomes is the third player in NFL history in the second in the Super Bowl era to have two separate six touchdown games in the season, and there are still five games left. Like, I think that's what people need to realize, that, like, this isn't over. Mahomes is the second year in the league, and he's now second in NFL history for most four touchdown games in the season. Wow. Like, this is – I think you're right. I don't think this is the foreboding, like, this is what the future looks like and it's horrible, but I do think that we're going to see more explosive, explosive nights out of – great offenses like this. I just think that the NFL's the king because it's parity, because literally any team can be any team. Mm -hmm. When you've got these outliers with these two teams and the Saints, fuck the Saints. (laughs) Because the Saints play defense. Like that's I'm not gonna talk about it in this podcast, but they're probably the best team in football. Actually, I take it back, we're talking about them next. It 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 destroys some of that idea of parity. It's like, oh anyone can be anyone unless the Chiefs, Rams or Saints come knocking. Yeah. And then just hold on to your butt. They're going to score a thousand points. You can't keep. And then it's so funny because, as like intellectually as a team, if your defense is good or even great, if you go down a touchdown offensively, your team starts to panic hmm. because you're like, I got to throw. I got to. I got to find a way to match them touchdown for touchdown. And that's and that's what I think is the most dangerous part of these two teams, the three teams really, is that let's say their defenses aren't playing great. You got to hope that your offense can keep their composure moving at that speed. Totally. They live at that speed. They live it. They live in a place where scoring a touchdown on every possession is expected. Most offenses do not. They cannot. It's not feasible. And now let's say you get in, let's say, oh, they don't play defense. Cool. Can you keep up? Do you have the horses to keep scoring points? Because Drew Brees during the Falcons game was throwing to concession workers. I'm convinced. <laughs> I cannot find them on NFLreference.com. They do not exist. They're mad and creative players. But they score touchdowns against the Falcons, who, spoiler alert, fucking suck. <laughs> and um, uh. I, I, you and I sat there Thanksgiving night after you hosted a, a just a, a brief second. I'm going to brag on you. You hosted a wonderful Thanksgiving for both of our families. Everyone left happy and full and healthy. And, again, just thank you for a wonderful day. And by 7 o'clock. And by 7 <laughs> o'clock. Later on, we, we hosted. I did not do it alone. Yeah, well, I'm going to give you all the credit here because after that, we sat on the couch and enjoyed um, the beginning of the Falcons game. Oh, it was awful. And then we determined not to hurt ourselves after such a wonderful day and turned off the Falcons game, but not before Drew Brees proved why um, he's probably going to be your league MVP this year. A couple of those balls were just 
perfect touchdown passes. I can't even really get too mad. I am mad. I'm not going to lie. I'm pretty pissed off. But I can't get too mad at him because he did things that were impressive. Susan, what do we do with these Falcons? Because I know what I've done, and I'll tell about that in a second. But what do we do as Falcons fans about these no good, very bad Falcons? We do what we did on Thursday. We turn on the game. We see how it goes. If it doesn't continue to go in our favor, we turn it off. Why would they let them? We don't want to let them hurt us. You know, we'll be here next season. Will we? Like we all, yes. Uh, what do, who are we going to cheer for? Who, who would you prefer? I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of enjoying having a free Sunday. Like, I've got to talk to you and record it. Um, it's been kind of nice. <laughs> yeah. You're not going to start cheering for anybody else. Uh, they're That's having true. a bad season. It happens. It's not enjoyable. So why watch the games when we're getting pummeled? It's not uh, not really a good fan behavior, but it's safest whatever. for us. Yep. Self care, yeah, Daniel. Self care is very important. Um, <laughs> someone who didn't get very well taken care of uh, last weekend, Alex Smith, who was recently signed by the Washington Racial Slurs. To be their quarterback, uh, he signed through 2023, I believe. He is um, 34 years old, and he destroyed his leg. And I've heard people who've seen it. I am not one of the people who watches um, pain porn. I don't watch this kind of stuff. Adam Schefter reported it on Twitter as a compound fracture, meaning the bone broke through the skin. Trauma surgeons discovered Smith suffered a spiral fracture in his leg. Oh. Um, a spiral fracture does not sound good because it's not defined as a long bone broken by rotational force. Oh, He's God. He's years old and faces a lengthy rehab, rehab process for return. Ew. Ew, indeed. That description was above and beyond what you needed to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, That's <was> disturbing. <laughs> I apologize, kind of. But you and I, neither one of us looked at it because why Ew. would you? Um, but you see this and you see kind of like – at least like you've seen, he's got monetary protection. He's accrued over $140 million in the course of his life um, in the NFL, as an NFL quarterback. His current contract, I believe, is 2018 cash payout is $40 million. So I have I, – I mean, it's easier for me to watch this than it is to watch the UCF kid get hurt on Saturday, the child who's yep. playing for free. Yep. Um, but this, it, it's so wild, man. It's 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 – a team can turn so quickly, and when we say, oh, we want the league to be tougher and rougher, this is why. Because if this happens to Drew Brees or Patrick Mahomes or Jared Goff, the league will have a conniption. This is why the rules are changing. I get it. The defensive players are faster and stronger. But, man, you got to ask yourself at some point, are we trying to make cigarettes safe? Hmm. Here's what's crazy to me. And you don't know – see, this is what's fun for us being married is that you weren't raised in sports. So I say the name Joe Theismann to you. What do you think? I got nothing. Okay, so Joe Theismann was a quarterback for the Washington Racial Slurs, and he destroyed his leg in similar fashion on a national mm-hmm. televised game. Here's the cool the, – the weird synergy. Alex Smith broke his leg to the day Theismann did. At the time of the break, score of both games was 23-21. Both games, ha- both plays happened on the 40-yard line, and Romeo Cornell was on the defensive staff of both teams that caused the injury. Who is the football nerd that figured that out? <laughs> it wasn't me, trust me. I'm reading <laughs> something. I was not. Good I God. Do, <laughs> this I, is not UD Pod's stats and information did not get a hold of that one. <laughs> that's just ridiculous. Who figured that out? <laughs> get but a day what, job. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's cool synergy. You think it's nerds gone run amok. And I think we're both right. I don't think either one of them, either one of us is really wrong here. Hey, it doesn't because. happen often. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get well soon, Alex Smith. Your team's name is racist, but um, I have nothing personally <laughs> against you. You're not a great football player, but, um, you know, hey. It is what it, like, what it, like, hey, man, if you're listening to this, and why would you? Don't come <laughs> back. You're 34. You made you so go. much money. Retire. Retire. Go coach somewhere, man. Go coach. Yeah, do nothing somewhere. <laughs> or do nothing. Either one. You can do that. Uh, Alex Smith, man. <sighs> they take me all my Alex Smith man jokes. Anyway, um, <laughs> Thanksgiving night, the Bears played their third division game in 13 days, which they won without their starting quarterback because their defense is terrified. Khalil Mack was traded from the Raiders this year um, for chicken scratch. And um, 
this is another moment of Gruden watch. So what's happening in John Gruden's world where the Raiders have um, on the fly dismantled their team after giving the John Gruden a $100 million tenure contract? Raiders fans, only nine years and five more games left. You're almost there. The turnaround could happen any time. Thanksgiving night, Khalil Mack helped the Bears win their third division game in 13 days, like I already said. Amari Cooper had 176 yards and two touchdowns for the Cowboys. And John Gruden is your coach for the next nine years. Now, they also traded Khalil Mack for first round draft picks. Susan, as the more team wins, the worse the draft pick gets. And if we, if I can't think of an, like, there's no real world analogy where someone's given job security for 10 years and then with no oversight. $100 million. Yeah, it's a lot and of money. This is one of those times where, you know, as a Falcons fan, you look over and you're like, you know, it could be way worse. Totally. It could be so much worse because while our owner does look like a um, silent movie villain, he's yeah. not inept enough to give John Gruden 10 years, $100 million. Like what Rangers fans at Deep Home 66, I'm super curious to how you're dealing with this stuff emotionally because, um, yeah, it's ugly. It's real ugly. And um, it's not getting any better. 10 years is a long time. 10 years is a long time. And, uh, your team's moving to Las Vegas next year because <laughs> your owner is Mark Davis. Um, we're going to talk about the NBA next. I do want to bring this up just really quickly. Dwight Howard's story, we're recording this at 5 o'clock on Sunday. The Dwight Howard story is out. It's making its rounds. I will say nothing about it because I don't know enough about everything that's going on. I will say this. Um, I hope we can get past the TMZ nature of the story and kind of dig into some of the larger issues brought up by it. If Dwight Howard is closeted, that's the business of Dwight Howard and the people he's sleeping with. Um, Transphobia is literally killing hundreds of people a year, particularly people of color. And if we can get past the TMZ shock jock headline bullshit and have that conversation, that's where I really hope this story goes. I'm afraid and I have enough common fucking sense to know that People are trash, and that's where it's going to end up. But, yeah. Totally. This is, honestly, uh, this is a situation where, uh, so I jumped on Twitter earlier just to oh, see no. what. No, well, <laughs> well, well, part of, I think, my perspective of it is that I jumped on your Twitter, mm-hmm. <laughs> where, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to follow or listen to someone who has some hateful shit to say about this situation. Sure. But um, I don't know. I think that, uh, if anything, I was blown away at all of people's perspectives on this on this topic. People being open-minded. People just saying, it's not my business and doesn't matter. Like, right. you know what I mean? And that's that's the perspective to have. And like, and it becomes... It's business. And, it becomes, but like, the, the, and that's 100% true, and that's why I said that, but also like, where he's allegedly threatening this person... Yes, that is also and like that's, that's where needs to be talked about exactly. that's happening. That's and that's what I really want the conversation to do. I don't yep. know if it'll happen, um, but I hope it will. Um, yep. Things have not been going great for his team recently. He's been playing actually pretty fucking well, but it's been a lot of hot shit in uh, Washington. And I'm going to just read some stories that Ernie Grunfeld, the, the GM from 2000, he signed I believe in 2003. He's still fucking there. And uh, this is what happened though, apparently a couple weeks ago. After Jeff, a teammate Jeff Green and Brooks uh, pushed Wall and the Wizards teammates to raise the level of intensity in practice last week, Wall fired back with a fuck you towards Brooks, leak sources said. Wall did apologize to Brooks shortly afterwards and to his teammates the day after. Um, this is after Kelly Oubre apparently went on an uh, expletive tir- uh, tirade against Brooks during a game, and they've announced that everyone's for sale to be traded, including Bradley Beal and John Wall, um, their cornerstones. And uh, it's all bad in Washington. And Susan, I'm telling you this because I want you to realize that this is really bad. Like this is friction of all level. You don't trade star players. Hmm. And I'm telling you right now that Ernie Grunfeld's seen it worse because of a sports story you don't know anything about. Wait, so why and is he trading everyone? Because that's how bad the, the personalities have gotten. Like it's, it's gotten untenable to like the, the, they're yelling at the coaches they are cursing each other out there. And so they're saying, screw it, we're going to trade everyone. And that's Start kind of fresh. A solution. Exactly. And it sounds ugly and it is ugly because if you're open to trading everyone, you've got a serious fucking problem on your basketball team. 
Yeah. But I'm telling you right now that this is not, this is not the worst thing that's happened on the Ernie Griffith's walk. Watch. In 2009. Oh, in 2009. Um, this is another thing. I'm really, it, it's fascinating that you didn't follow sports before he met because this is a story you're going to, your jaw's going to the floor. I don't know if there's any subject that I could be like, in 2009, this happened. So, I mean, yeah. Anyway, Aired. so apparently um, Javaris Crittenden, who is currently in jail for murdering someone, hmm. was a basketball player on the Washington Wizards alongside Gilbert Arenas. Gilbert Arenas um, and Javaris Crittenden had, on Christmas Eve, gotten into a argument over gambling debts about them playing games on a on a plane, and uh, Crittenden said that he would shoot Gilbert Arenas over the money. Oh. Gilbert Arenas then brought several unloaded firearms to his locker and pointed them at Crittenden and said, well, pick one, shoot me with them. Um, <laughs> what? Yeah. Uh, on his 28th birthday, January 6, 2010, he was suspended indefinitely without pay until the investigation was complete. Um, the league was compelled to act because well, this happened on the 24th. So on the 6th, they suspended him. They felt compelled to act because a few the day prior during pregame introductions, um, the team surrendered surrounded him as pregame introductions, and he pretended to shoot them with finger guns. <laughs> what? Yeah, he was suspended from that point on for the rest of the season. Um, Crittenden, as I mentioned, uh, was charged with murder in 2011 in Atlanta with the uh, shooting of Julian Jones. Um, yeah, that is Gilbert Arenas. All right. And that is the Wizards, and that's what this team has seen. So, like, Ernie Grunfeld, I, in my personal and public opinion, should have been fucking fired for this because he put these guys together. Like, this is the group he built. This is not like, oh, it's my first day on the job. This is the team I got handed and they acted a fool. No, no, he got his job in 2003. He's been general manager since then. This occurred on his watch, and now they're having a fire sale for everyone, and no one's fired Ernie Grunfeld. Totally. Maybe he should he should go away. Like, hey, Ernie, we're gonna have rebuild again on the fly. You want to take the reins? Of course I do. Make sure the check still clears. Hmm. Um, my second favorite story of the NBA has been uh, the Kevin Durant, Draymond Green dramatical situations. So as I covered last week, Draymond called KD a bitch during a game. Said no one wants you to be here. Da da da. Um, in the four games after Draymond hurt his feelings. Kevin Durant was 34 for 87 from the field and one of 17 for three. I'm not saying that uh, he proved Javon right. I am saying that they'll be really a lot happier when Steph Curry comes back. Those aren't good numbers. I think it's really funny that the smallest, like, allegedly nicest guy on the team is apparently, like, the one who holds down everyone and is like, no, we're not going to fight now. Steph Curry is the peacemaker. Hmm. It's, and you don't really expect all the time. Um, you don't really know who's going to be that guy in the locker room. But apparently it's Steph Curry, and good for them. Because, by God, they need it. Because I bet the over for them. If I have gambling really, I would have bet the over for them. I need them to kind of get it the fuck together. Um, before we get into college basketball, college football, excuse me, in the end of the week, I do want to talk about this. You may have heard of Mississippi Senator Cindy Hyde-Smith. She is the one who made the public lynching comments last um, earlier this month. And she also pushed a resolution who praised Confederate soldiers, quote, unquote, defending their homeland. This is the woman who the MLB gave $5,000 to in their donation. The same Major League Baseball that says it was a, uh, a leader in civil rights. She sounds like a perf then, perfectly reasonable human. But the only reason we know about this is because now the MLB is trying to get their money back. Like, uh -oh, oh, it's too, it's too hot. It's too public. You need it back. Like, I get it. Like, corporations give to lots of people, and they give on all sides of the aisle, but <sighs> bad MLB. Very bad. Before we get into college football, I'm going to talk about two teams we're not going to talk about because they're two bad football teams. Um, two Arkansas players were suspended for flirting with members of the dance team and cheerleaders, and I get that. When uh, I was in college and playing football, there were rules about you know fraternizing with the children and, and dancing, not because – well, partially because te uh, teenage children are, should be policed in that manner, but also because there's a power dynamic. There's a, there's a problem there. With, you're on the football team, you're on the cheerleaders with the dancing. There is a, a an unquestionable 
problematic power dynamic. I get that. But these Arkansas players weren't suspended for talking to their own dance team. No, no, no. Apparently before the Mississippi State game, they spent part of their warm-ups chatting up the MSU cheerleaders and taking pictures with them. Um, Chad Morris, his, their coach, said they will not be they will not be here today or yesterday or any part of this week for unacceptable behavior, actions that are completely unacceptable to anything we're about. You didn't play football. I get this. But I would say that for a majority, a lot of people who start playing football, attention from girls is one of the reasons. And guess what? Attention from girls who don't go to your – people who don't go to your school are like are, – are, are gold in college. Like this is – this is why they play. I don't see – Am I crazy, Susan? I don't know. I mean, do you not think that, that power dynamic that you spoke to exists regardless of what team you play for? I do because because it's also hard for me to think that the coaches are thinking about that because <laughs> well, they well, obviously don't really care about right. What right. No, for me, the, it's, it's less of it's less of a problem when they're not the same school because you're when it's in the same school, you're policed by the same people. Sure. And so, if a whole part of something done has something. There's something wrong. It's it's easier internally to sweep things under the rug. Got it. And so for me, that's where I was always like, if that's the policy, that makes perfect fucking sense. Don't put ourselves, don't put anyone in a bad position. Yep. But like for the Missouri cheer squad to be chatted up by Arkansas players or Mississippi, yeah, Missouri or Mississippi State, excuse me, I don't see the problem. Like, I, I, they're not doing anything. Like, like Arkansas is two and nine. Let them talk to some girls. Right. Seems a little over the top. It seems like they, you know, maybe want to control every aspect of these young men's lives. Yep. <sighs> power, it's, power, power. <laughs> it's, and it's so funny because we covered that on the solo show I did earlier this year um, on power. But you're right. It's such a, a naked display and, and abuse of the power dynamic that the coaches are like, oh, no, 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 no. And it's not like they weren't stretched adequately to get blown out by Mississippi State. Like, what the hell are they talking about? Like, we don't need – like, they're they're stretched enough. They got their heads kicked in. They're stretched enough. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to talk about college football now, and I have a bad news for all our listeners. George, uh, Columbia season's over. They finished with a winning record, first back-to-back winning season in years. But um, that means you will not be hearing any more updates for America's number one team. We'll see you all next year. We do have – Updates from America's other favorite team, the Georgia Bulldogs. And um, I always hate this week because this week you're supposed to pretend that Georgia Tech is a legitimate football program, that this is a rivalry, and that um, everything is super serious between them. But I can't muster the lie, guys. Georgia beat Tech 21-45 to this year, and it wasn't as close as the numbers would suggest. Those uh, points were a lot of garbage time points for Georgia Tech. They look like garbage and um i'm about sick and damn tired of pretending that they matter <laughs> i'm serious like we have friends who are tech fans we do like my buddy greg he texted me at i think it was like half of the first quarter which by the way you and i for i forgot that the kick was at 12 and you yep. and i were at the crimes of grindelwald during the first half wonderful correct wonderful. Pretty. <laughs> it's enjoyable not a bad way to spend an afternoon now agreed I always bring this point up. Like for 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 those of you keeping count, and you all should have been, Georgia gained 343 yards in the first half on 171 yards passing and 172 yards rushing. That's what we all call balance. Jake Fromm was total 15 for three touchdowns. Holyfield and Swift each had 67 yards of offense rushing. At the half, Tech had 66 yards of offense. There's a tweet that I may have retweeted that. Had a tech player, you know, before the game with his hashtag THWG and flexing on the field without a shirt on. Keith Marshall, former University of Georgia running back, quote tweeted that and said, y'all don't lift weights. <laughs> I think I saw a gif of Kirby Smart eating popcorn on the sidelines. Is that like, real? I mean, he may have easily. You know, it's, <laughs> it's hard work whipping that ass every year. And, um, like, yo – You gotta understand, and I'm trying to explain this to tech fans. So this is also the, the other tradition of the year is that tech fans say we should fire Paul Johansson. They end up not firing him. And I try to say, Congratulations, your program's been set back 15 years. And they say, Well, what do you mean? And they all lean on the, oh, it's hard to recruit at tech, it's hard to get good kids at tech because it's so academically strenuous. Stanford almost went to a playoff a couple of years ago. Y'all tougher than Stanford? 
But we don't have Stanford's campus. Motherfucker, you have Atlanta. Atlanta's yep. turned into such a recruiting hotbed that Georgia gets all the top talent out of Atlanta. Other teams get the rest of the talent out of Atlanta. And Georgia's selling it on the year it'll be close to home. Tech is in Atlanta. And it has a great campus, in my yeah, opinion. Come on, that was a lot. It's nice. It's no, it's fun. in the heart of the city, which is fantastic. But that's the thing is that people are saying, oh, it's tech. It's tech. You're said Atlanta has more undergraduate students than any city in America. You sell the city. When I went to Columbia, they, they sold Columbia, yeah, but they also sold New York City to me. Totally. Pretty good job. They did a very good job of selling it. What, you've got to under, what people have to understand about tech and the recruiting, what they've done is because of the style of offense they're on, that triple option horse shit, they put a cap on the talent of kids who are going to go there. If I'm a receiver and Coach Paul Johnson comes to my house and I want to catch footballs in college, why would I go to tech? You're going to stalk block. And if you can't get top-end receiving talent, then guess what? You're not getting top-end quarterback talent or running back talent because talent falls talent. You don't see people who have one five-star recruit, and that's it. Ed um, Ed Oliver is the only player in, in recruiting history who's a five-star who didn't go to a Power 5 school. He's in Houston. They thought they would follow him there. They did not. So let's say you're tech. You recruit – you can't recruit receivers. You can't recruit quarterbacks. You can't even recruit really running backs because who wants to have their accomplishments downplayed? Because when you come out and draft people are looking at you, say, oh, but he's in a system that cultivates all these yards. Okay, you can't recruit those things. So how do you recruit alignment? You can't. So you recruit undersized alignment to run your specific option stuff. What, well, D-Palm, what about the defense? Defense will be strong. Why would it be strong? If you're not recruiting any top flight offensive talent, why would a top flight defensive player go there? What happened was early on in Paul Johnson's tenure, he was taking the leftovers from people in the region. And that was okay. He was able to do things with those leftovers because he was getting top five leftovers. What's happened is the region has changed. UCF, USF, FAU, that's three new schools that did not exist in this kind of playing field 10 years ago. UCF's over here saying the national chance two years running because they don't lose any fucking fool again because they don't play anyone. But guess what? Me saying I'm a national champ means the kid who didn't quite make it to Georgia or didn't quite get recruited by Bama is dying to go to UCF. That could be tech spot. But because of what you created, because of who, whenever they file, fire Paul Johnson, it's going to take two or three recruiting cycles to get rid of the bad football players who are currently at tech. And let's be very real. Those are bad football players. They did not look to be on the same athletic field as Georgia on Saturday. When I was in high school, we had a uh, we had a screen during our two minute drill. We our two minute drill was a five wide set, and uh, we had two screens: Georgia and Tech. Georgia was to the left, Tech was to the right. And we once asked our offensive coordinator, said, "Well, why is Tech to the three receiver side?" He says, "Honestly, it takes three Tech recruits to make two Georgia ones." And that was in 2003. It's only gotten worse, and the situation they've created at Tech has made it to where. Like you saw, you read the article I wrote in 2015. It's not even fair anymore. It's not even fun anymore. It's just a bludgeoning. And it's one of those things that everyone, they play it rivalry weekend every year and everyone wants to tell you it's a rivalry. When I say Georgia rivals, you think Tennessee, you think Florida, you think Auburn. It takes you a while to get to Tech. And I'm tired of pretending. It's true. Let Tech play Georgia State. There was some tweet that said, Tech, come tag in Kennesaw State. And I was like, Braun versus two <laughs> jobbers. Like, that's what it's Braun Schoenberg versus two jobbers. What do you want? We're going to hurt. So I'm in the front row. It doesn't matter. Like, it's, 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 and it's not me coming from a place of Georgia high hat fandom, although it kind of is because fuck Tech. But also, more than anything, it's coming from a, like just a quality of the recruiting. Like, you can do better. You can be better. Ask for better for yourself. Let's go through the rest of the SEC. We'll get to some interesting games as we go through them, including <clears throat> what happened at the Horseshoe. Mississippi State beat Ole Miss 35 to three in the Egg Bowl. Arkansas lost 38 to nothing in Missouri. Should have let those kids play, not to spend them, right, Coach? Hmm. Florida ended FSU's bowl streak 41 to 14 in their first losing season in, in I believe, 40 years, and will not be going to the bowl for the same um, first time in the same amount of time. Um, Bama beat Auburn 52-21. Bama will be placing Georgia at the uh, SEC title game next week. We'll talk about that in a second. Vandy 
Tennessee 38 to 13. Kentucky beat Louisville 56 to 10. Clemson beat South Carolina 56 to 35. And in the seven overtimes, LSU fell to Texas A&M 74 to 72. Now, there's been a lot of hay being made on the internet by Big Ten fans and Big 12 fans about, look at this conference, don't play defense. Do, 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 do. It took seven overtimes to get to basically a Big 12 score. Starting on the 25-yard line, like that full drive. It's like it's a lot of talk from people who um, want to make fun of the SEC for taking seven overtimes. And uh, this is why every time the Big 12 comes up to be in a big stage, they – fall on their asses, and I laugh at them. Um, that's all the SEC news. Let's talk about the game that's going to happen on Saturday because, Susan, we're at a point in the world where everyone's telling me that Georgia's got a chance. You and I are both Georgia fans. Again, I'm sorry. I think that, I think that I've, I've, I've let you know enough about my experience as a Georgia fan to not hope, right? Right? Uh, I mean, sitting on the couch and watching that – terrible game last year is you got to protect yourself you know there's always a chance but that doesn't mean that we should uh expect that chance to fall our way like people like uh sony michelle current running back for the patriots damn good dog he tweeted out we want bama no we don't no we don't we prefer to play someone else if, actually if, if there's, <laughs> what else do you have Right. What are other options? You're out here. Yep, just Bama's, huh? Just Bama's on the menu. All right. Well, I guess we'll take a Bama. Um, Tua's playing amazingly. They blew the doors off Auburn. I think that Georgia is going to be the best offense that they've played this year. I'm just not entirely sure it's going to matter. I think there's enough talent receiving wise so we can stress some of that those corners out who haven't really been stressed this year. Offensively, I don't know what we're going to do with Tua because we don't do well just as a typical Kirby. Saving defense doesn't do great against running quarterbacks, and that's what Tua is. What the the wrinkle for me is if Justin Fields gets involved, mm. because every time I've seen him this year, I've had the question mark, the question mark. But the the UMass game was where the first time where I was like, okay, that was some scary man of arm talent. Let's put him at quarterback. And like they had like Bama had to do against Georgia last year in the national title game. We may have to see a change at halftime and. uh yeah, I think Georgia's going to get the doors blown off them. And no, this is not an elaborate reverse jinx. This is not that. This is me just speaking my <laughs> mind. Don't laugh at that. Yeah, we'll we'll watch until it's not fun anymore. I'm not going this year. I tell you that much. Oh God, no. I don't regret going to the national title. I don't regret it, but I did. Knowing what I know now, I wouldn't have gone. <laughs> it was awful. It was awful to watch. Oh. Before we move on to the national top 25, I do want to mention one thing. Um, this is just free advice to everyone who ever wants to go to a college football game. After A&M beat LSU, apparently an A&M staffer who maybe had been overserved or maybe was just a crazy person punched and I guess shoved or punched an LSU um, assistant on the chest. The LSU assistant has a pacemaker and heart issues. So Kevin Falk pulled him, pulled the A&M uh, staffer off. They got into a scuffle. If you know the name Kevin Falk, it's because he played football at LSU and was the running back for the Patriots for years. My advice to you is this. I don't care how big the win is. I don't care how excited you are. If a man looks like he used to carry footballs in the NFL, don't anger him. Don't do it. It won't go well for you. This has been free advice from UD Pod. Now, top 25. And rivalry week shouldn't matter for everyone. It doesn't. Because some of these rivalries are Georgia, Georgia Tech. We gotta be honest about what those are, but some of these rivalries are a lot of fun, and some of them matter. And um, we get to win. That was a lot of fun for me to watch from my couch. Um, top of the top twenty-five: Texas beat Arkan beat Kansas. Excuse me, twenty-four seventeen. UCF beat USF um, thirty-eight to ten. The UCF quarterback uh, when it was carted off, I believe, in the third quarter with a horrific leg injury. Um, uh, McKenzie Milton. I missed it because I have good injury luck. I said as I jinx myself for the rest of these night games. Um, and I tend to miss a lot of these injuries, but um, best of wishes to him. It was a horrific break. It looked really bad from what everyone's telling me. And, uh, yeah, get well soon. The rear Greer Hive um, came to a screeching halt as Oklahoma beat West Virginia 59-56. Washington State beat Wazoo uh, 28-15. Thank you, Washington. Or, excuse me, Washington beat Washington State 28-15. Thank you very much, Washington. The game. I will do that last. We'll do that one last. 
Syracuse beat Boston College 42 to 21. Illinois lost to Northwestern 24 to 16. Penn State beat Maryland 38 to 3. Miami, Coach Ritchie had lost control apparently on Monday, beat Pitt 24 to 3. Uh, both those games. Iowa State beat K State 42 to 38. Uh, Notre Dame beat USC 24 to 17. Okay, look. So, Susan, Notre Dame going to be in the playoff again this year? Like yeah. they made the shuttle game against Bama all those years ago? I think just, just know something. They're going to get the absolute shit kicked out of them. By some very good football team because they they barely beat a bad USC team. Like they, this is a Notre Dame team that's been skating by the skin of their teeth all year, and they've been telling us to show just how good they are, just how talented they are, and all um, how good you know this football team is. They beat a <laughs> overrated Michigan team 24-17 to open the season. They squeaked by Ball State 24-16. They beat Vanderbilt 22 to 17. Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt. 24-17. They beat Wake Forest 56-27. They beat Notre Dame. They beat Sanford 38-17. They beat Vodtech 45-23. They beat Pitt 19-14. So what you're saying is they're not they're not that good. They're not only are they not that good, they are only in the position they're in because their name is Notre Dame. Overrated. And they're overrated. And, and they're gonna be a playoff team. They're probably gonna be a top two or top one playoff team. And um Watching them get their – that's the team I want chanting we want Bama because the winner of Georgia – Bama is going to be in the playoff. And if the winner's Georgia, the committee's got an interesting thing on their hands. First of all, I'll have to wake up from this dream I'd be dreaming. But also, <laughs> how do you keep this Bama team out? Is it the second year in a row Bama gets in without winning their conference? Because last year they, lost, they didn't make it to the conference championship game because of the Auburn fiasco. Is it going to be two years in a row that a, a team that did not win the SEC also makes the playoff? And will it be back-to-back SEC championships for Georgia? Look, a well, man can dream. It's not going to happen, but I can hope it would. Let's talk about the one game I didn't mention. Let's talk about Ohio State-Michigan. I want to start with Michigan because Michigan, I've been told for years that John Harbaugh was a quarterback developer, that he was going to uh, revitalize Michigan football. He's been there since 2015. He's never finished higher than 10th in the country. He plays in an overrated conference. He's perceived as good because of Big Ten, but he's never developed a quarterback. Shea, the current quarterback, he's a transfer from Ole Miss. And for the record, Big Ten fans, Michigan's quarterback who helped him get to a number three ranking or whatever, he couldn't cut it in the SEC, so he ran to the Big Ten. These is facts. And what kills me, what absolutely kills me is that, yes, they got Molly Watt by Ohio State, 62-39. to But then you had Gus Johnson trying to redeem Urban Meyer's repeated failings on television by winning a fucking football game? No, 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 no. He did not suffer from his suspension and his mishandling of the Zaxman situation. He was lightly tapped in the wrist for bungling a HR fiasco at a multi-billion dollar organization. That's what happened. He's not, he didn't overcome something. He created these problems. You're telling about his health concerns? Yeah, he had health concerns once. When he realized that he had built a house of cars at Florida, said his heart hurt, sat out for a year, and then took a job at Ohio State. What happened to the Florida team? Oh, three of them got arrested, um, and all the personality concerns that he'd cultivated while at Gainesville came crashing down on the program. They're barely finally recovering. So save me the um, Urban Meyer's health is, is the reason why he may not coach next year. No, no, no. The block has gotten too hot, and when the block gets hot, he leaves. He cultivated, mentored, and facilitated that man terrorizing his wife. I don't want to hear about what he's overcome to beat fucking Michigan. The fact that 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 they're saying that like that's that's proof that he's overcome it is <laughs> disturbing. Like those are completely unrelated things. Completely. And you don't. That's not how you overcome an issue. Like he didn't do anything. Right. I hate Ohio State. They're the worst. They are the worst, but guess what? They keep they, – they're the reason why I can say fire Jim Harbaugh and no one's going to question it because I don't think Jim Harbaugh is that great of a coach. I also think that Michigan fans need to recalibrate what they can actually expect because you're Michigan. You're not exactly in a hotbed of recruiting. You're Michigan. It's not 1983. You're Michigan. See, also, Notre Dame. Susan, I really do appreciate you coming on the podcast. Um, do you have anything you want to talk about before you get out of here? 
I don't think so. Thanks for having me on. It's a privilege as always. Well, I'm going to edit this bad boy, and you and I are going to go to the uh, the internet concert because my wife is that much cooler than me that I'd never heard of this group probably five months ago, and now we're going to a show tonight, and I couldn't be looking forward to it more. That was your show. This is your outro. See you guys next week.